te mana o te tanga te whenua, te nga koe, nga te whātua. Kia ora tātau, jivli sfi, greetings to you all. It's always a great pleasure to be back in Auckland, um, and I'm very grateful to so many of you for turning out today. <coughs> As Giselle said, um, I practice global New Zealand history, a craft so eccentric I may be the only exponent. <laughs> it involves developing a solution to a resonant problem in, New Zealand, in the New Zealand Historical Laboratory, then testing and adapting it globally, and finally bringing its refined form back home. My current research project, part old, part new, explores the economic and cultural integration of distant regions by great cities, ranging from London's relationship with New Zealand, which is the archetypal case, uh, to the integration by Athens of the Crimean region in the ancient world in the 5th and 4th centuries BC. As Giselle said in her overgenerous introduction, uh, I begin with this national, with the national scar over which the, over which this very structure was built, the First World War. Am I still audible if I do this? Step away. Yeah. I begin with the national scar over which this very structure was built, the First World War. 100,000 New Zealanders served in this conflict, of whom 60,000 became casualties, including 18,000 killed, from a population of little over one million. The equivalent in the United States today would be about 20 million total casualties, including six million dead. And these, this terrible toll occurred not in New Zealand or in its own Pacific, uh, but 18,000 kilometers away. Much the same happened again in World War II, with New Zealand choosing to invade Italy rather than focusing on resisting the Japanese in its own Pacific in 1943. This reflects a deep engagement with British interests engagement might being my attempt at a neutral term for collaboration. Some find New Zealand's conflation of its interests with, with those of Britain cringingly colonial, an embarrassing scab, if not a scar, which should not be picked at. But the historian's task is to try to understand the past, good, bad, both, or neither. New Zealand introduced conscription in late 1916. The flow of trained conscripts to the Western Front did not begin until a year later, and the war ended a year after that. Consequently, only about 20% of the 100,000 who actually served were conscripts. 80% were volunteers. Exactly what these men thought they were fighting for is contested. The inside of people's heads is the most difficult of historians to reign, especially if they're part of the silent majority rather than elites who tend to, to blab. The idea that some were in search of adventure, uh, expecting a low casualty conflict like the Boer War, which was uh, about as lethal as the Huntley coal mine, uh, works only for the earliest volunteers. It soon became clear that we were, we were talking about a bloodier conflict here. Despite censorship, casualty lists and terminal telegrams quickly revealed this much higher, blood, uh, much higher toll. Yet mass volunteering continued. The notion that men were fighting for their mates in their, immediately, in their immediate military units uh, also lacks traction. Casualties, reinforcements, plus leave in France and Britain 
meant that turnover was extremely high on the Western Front. Mates were here today, gone tomorrow. The great majority of volunteers were New Zealand born, but of British descent. So a third possibility is that they simply inherited a British patriotism intense enough to die for. Yet New Zealand's willingness to fight for Britain had been less marked 30 years earlier, when the government declined to offer a contingent to support Britain in its war with the Sudan. Indeed, the Minister of Defence in 1885, John Balance, wrote that his sympathies were with the Mahdi, the leader of the Sudanese rebels, so-called. Majority sympathies may not have been with Balance, but he was no lone voice crying in the wilderness. He became Prime Minister five years later. A similar shift took place across the Tasman at the same time. New South Wales did send a contingent to the Sudan in 1885, but this is now widely seen as a publicity stunt by an acting Premier. The colony's leading statement, statesman, Sir Henry Parks, had a similar attitude to John Balance. There were, said Parks, no need for Australia to risk its sons in a doubtful war of aggression. Unquote. Australia did not introduce conscription in World War I, but again, the difference was more apparent than real. Australians volunteered at much the same rate as New Zealanders, and an even higher proportion of those who fought became casualties. Including Australia highlights an issue I'd previously neglected, that of Irish Catholics. Irish-born Catholics were just over 3% of the Australian population, and just over 1% of the Australians who volunteered and served in 1914-18. This seemed to confirm suspicions about Irish disloyalty, as did the vocal opposition of some Catholics, including Archbishop Daniel Mannix, to conscription. But the union movement, the Labour Party, and a great many Protestants also opposed conscription while supporting the war. Irish Catholic to my to, uh, to Irish Catholic migration to Australia and New Zealand had slowed to a trickle after 1880. So the great majority of Catholic young men, young men of Irish descent, were native-born. Recent research suggests that these volunteered at very nearly the rate of Protestants on both sides of the Tasman. They did so despite Britain's long history of oppressing Catholic Ireland and despite some local history of Irish resistance. I think I'm getting feedback from that, so I might move away. The latter dates back at least to the Eureka Stockade. I'm still getting feedback, so it doesn't matter. Uh, the Eureka Stockade on the Victorian goldfields in 1854, Australia's only battle between Europeans. Most of the two dozen men of the two dozen rebels who died there were Irish Catholics, as was, as was the man who shot and wounded Queen Victoria's son in Sydney in 1868. He'd probably get a medal from the Crown now. Um, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, excuse me. I made a treasonous comment and I'm being punished for it. Um, an event followed by substantial unrest in New Zealand's strongly Irish Catholic West Coast goldfields. On top of this, while the Easter Rising in Dublin in 1916 attracted, um, yeah, this is pretty close to the anniversary, attracted little antipathy and Irish support, its ruthless repression by the British was widely disliked and may indeed have led to a slight downturn in antipathy and Irish volunteering. Yet somehow, between 1885 and 1816, young Irish Catholic men in the Antipodes became almost as willing to fight for Britain as their fellow settlers. In previous work, I tried to explain this with the recolonization thesis, which Giselle was good enough to refer to. New Zealand began exporting frozen meat, cheese, and butter to Britain in 1882, as you probably all know, and quickly became to specialize in this trade supplemented by wool, which also went mainly to Britain. The link soon thickened into a virtual bridge 
between the Britain of the South and the Britain of the North. An inter-island ferry service more reliable than that across Cook Strait today. <laughs> By 1914, there were 99 big ships involved, each making the round trip two or three times a year, five weeks out, five weeks back, and hanging around for however long the watersiders took to, to fill the hold. They carried 300,000 tonnes of food a year to Old Britain by 1914 and a similar cargo of miscellaneous cargo, back, uh, a similar volume of miscellaneous cargo back to New Zealand. Australia and Britain similarly recolonised each other at the same time. The market for Australian wool, it's true, was more international, but Australian meat, dairy and wheat exports were increasingly geared to supplying the British market. That was a quote. Some num numbers indicate the speed of the shift. In 1890, the colony of Victoria exported only 3% of its agricultural production. Most of its farmers were busy feeding marvellous Melbourne. By 1911, it exported 64% of its massively increased agricultural production. What we have here is the economic development of a virtual hinterland. Uh, and I'll take a moment to explain precisely what I mean by this. The natural hinterland around a great city, Paris for example, uh, is the town supply district. The region around it which provides the bulk of its food. In the case of Paris, uh, fertile regions immediately around it, you know, within, say, 100 miles of Paris supplied it. When a great city outgrows that hinterland, it sometimes seeks to develop virtual hinterlands, far-flung town supply districts, which could be hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands kilometres away, which act as supplements to its natural hinterland. Before rail in the 1840s, this needed water transport. Could be rivers, could be canals, could be oceans. But the volume was so great that overland transport was impracticable before rail. The system became mutually reinforcing. The natural hinterland would pull out of grain production and of those other products which are also durable, cured meat, cheese. They could come from long range and remain edible. The natural hinterland, the town supply district, uh, sorry, I forgot this, I said natural hinterland, I'm now moving to the natural hinterland, also adapted, that's the one nearby, uh, and sort of Sorry, I think I've got this wrong. Let me start again. <laughs> the natural hinterland pulled out of the supply of durables, grain and so on, and turned instead to things like market gardening, fresh milk, fresh fruit. The virtual hinterland massively increased its production of those same self-same durables. So, this, so the two systems adapted to each other so they fitted like a neatly broken glass. And it wasn't easy for them to break. They became mutually dependent. The hub city, the great city, would have multiple uh, virtual hinterlands because it didn't want to have all its eggs in one basket. The virtual hinterlands would have only one hub city. What I'm interested in this, in, in this paper is the return cargo. It was in effect subsidised by the massive flow of exports from the virtual hinterland, New Zealand to London, as were a couple of hundred, sometimes more, passengers per ship. <coughs> These imports included potential vectors of ideological change. Books, magazines, school texts, Texts, maps, manuals, films, photographs, cartoons, toys, and other image bearers. The list goes on. 
There are also human vectors, such as teachers and preachers. From the 1890s, I quote some other historians, there was an increasing dominance of the Australian market by British publishers. By 1930, the Australasian book trade was almost entirely in British hands. Even maps and wall charts were chiefly from the United Kingdom, for which read London. The effect, I argued, was to re-socialise white antipodeans from a loose British collective identity with independent aspirations, think of balance and parks, to an intensely an imagined community with other Britons. This wasn't inherited from parents. This was subsequently reconstructed by massive reciprocal flows of both, tra of both food and culture. New Zealand's long-range engagement and Australia's long-range engagement was less with Britain as a whole, although that started to blur as London's natural hinterland extended to virtually the whole of Britain, to almost the whole of Britain. I mustn't get my virtuallys mixed up here. Between 1880 and 1916, Britain imported 106 million sheep and lambs from New Zealand, of which all but 6 million went to London. 46 million from Australia, of which 34 million went to London, and 70 million from South America, of which only 18 million went to London. The great metropolis was not only the economic hub, but also the chief culture producer of both the British world and the British Empire. In more recent work, I found that London had been in the business of recolonization for 350 years before it turned to the Antipodes. Due to the Black Death in 1348 and repeated later strikes of bubonic plague, London stopped growing until about 1520, but then grew strongly for four centuries. Between 1520 and 1640, it grew about eightfold, from 50,000 people to 400,000. As any map of the English Civil War, of English Civil War allegiance will show you, those of you who are lucky enough to have studied the English Civil War at school, um, will show you the area supporting Parliament corresponds pretty precisely with London's expanded contiguous hinterland, namely the south and east of England. As yet, the only geographically separated virtual hinterland was the west riding of Yorkshire, um, intensely li linked to London by the wool and cloth trades via navigable, navigable rivers and the seaport of Hull. Puritan teachings and preachings were a marked feature of the return cultural traffic. Lund Hull and the West Riding were the only region in the north of England to staunchly support Parliament during the Civil War. That's a little gift to um, my British colleagues. London's chief coal supplier, the Tyneside region around Newcastle, was royalist in the 1640s, partly because it disliked Parliament's ally, the Scots, because they had conquered it, and partly because the coal trade was then handled largely by East Anglian shipping. From the 1650s, direct links with London strengthened rapidly and Tyneside gave no support to the Jacobites in 1688, 1715, or 1745. To quote English historians, rising demand for, for coal in the capital created a near umbilical economic and cultural fusion between Newcastle and London, the consumption habits of the former being moulded by its relationship with the latter. Newcastle's close relations with London were an important accelerator in the transfer of the latest metropolitan fashions in dress, furniture and china to Newcastle, together with the latest books, plays and ideas. The New Zealand effect. These ideas included new forms of Englishness, including at least two competing versions of Protestantism, and a racist Anglo-Saxonism. 
which implied that virtues such as individualism and the love of liberty were hardwired into English genes. Such collective identities were not necessarily invented in the hub city, in this case London, but were selected, adapted and redistributed by it. Anglo-Saxonism's rise began with the recurrence of London's growth in the 1520s. It dates to then precisely. A similar ideology, Batavianism, referring to another virtue-ridden ancient Germanic people, emerged at the same time in Holland, which Amsterdam was busy recolonizing at the time, the very same time, 1520s. Other strands of Englishness were less overtly ideolo ideological. The English were a plain but decent folk, eating plain but decent food, the roast beef of old England, not continental kickshaws. They wore plain but decent clothes and sober colours, not foppish French fashions. A recent book called The Making of Englishmen informs us that by 1618, the colour yellow had been utterly stigmatised as the most un-English of hues denoting Catholicism, treachery, and a host of other unnatural vices besides. Anyone wearing yellow here? Mind? I see a couple of, I see a few English scattered around the audience. London's growth continued. By 1707, it had, it had outgrown England, and we begin to see the intensification of a British identity a bid to include Scotland and Wales. This was not easy. For one thing, contempt for a Celtic other was another component of Englishness. But Britain, British, did take. Scots, Welsh and Protestant Irish eventually bought into it from the mid-18th century. I quote, Contact with London helped to shape a Scottish identity that was based on an emerging formulation of Britishness. 18th century Scots were taught English history rather than their own. In the early 19th century, London outgrew even this British hinterland, not all bits of Britain, but most of it, and turned to Catholic Ireland and continental Europe for supplementary food. These suppliers improved, proved inadequate or unreliable. From the 1880s, the recolonization of New Zealand, Australia, and Canada, and to some extent South Africa, provided a more satisfactory alternative. The accompanying shared collective identity made Greater Britain a reality, though an unofficial one. As Douglas Cole noted 50 years ago, Greater Britainism was vitally independent upon Anglo-Saxonism ex -Anglo and a Caucasian nationalism, sorry, a Caucasian racialism. And I, end quote. And this was at least partly because that is what the Dominions wanted, to enable them to keep out non-British immigrants and to claim full parity with old Britons. We're not just colonials, we're just as British as you are. This meant that they were both able and willing to bulk out old British manpower and resources in both world wars, which was arguably crucial to Britain's survival. Prior to this, however, between 1815 and the 1890s, a partial British recolonization of the United States stood in for the Dominions. New York was London's chief lieutenant in the US. By 1860, its port, its port received 68% of all US imports and 75% of all US immigrants, mostly from Britain and Ireland. From the 1820s, New York began doing some recolonizing of its own, mainly in the upper Midwest. Much of this region had first been colonized by Southerners from the slave states. In Indiana, well over half of the population was of Southern birth or descent. Before the American Civil War of 1861-5, the state is said to have been, I quote, a wash in southern regional identity. It was the stronghold of the Peace Democrats, also, in, also called 
butternuts and copperheads who opposed the conflict. And Southerners featured very large in Indiana's pre-war politics. Yet, Indiana was the second biggest contributor state to the Northern Army in proportion to military-aged male population. Only 2% of its 197,000 soldiers were drafted. The rest were volunteers. Like Catholic Irish in First World War Australia and New Zealand, younger Indiana men, whatever the Southerners, uh, the, their elders might say, had changed their tune. And here too, it looks like recolonization was pulling the strings. 18th century New York City grew even faster than London, from 70,000 to over 1 million between 1810 and 1860. Indiana and the rest of the upper Midwest became a crucial supplier of New York's grain and salt meat. The early link from the mid-1820s was convoluted, a strange water circle going from New York down the Atlantic to New Orleans and then up the Mississippi River system, up the Ohio by steamboat and then back down the same way. This was followed from about 1840 by canal and lake connections linking up to the Erie Canal finished in the 1820s. Uh, which allowed much greater volume, followed from, in the 1850s, by railroad, railroads. By 1860, New York and the Northeast were importing 2.3 million tonnes of cargo from the upper Midwest. The return traffic, including teachers and preachers in thousands, an entire public schooling system, plus its books and those of Indiana's 1,098 public libraries. The dramatized version of Uncle Tom's Cabin was staged, I quote, numerous times in Indianapolis, unquote. Now, the main message was not abolitionist or pro-African American. On the contrary, Indiana did not want any blacks, even as slaves. Instead, its white men fought to preserve the Union the sacred union. As with London's Greater Britain, New York's North had to adapt its imagine, imagined community to fit in its new virtual hinterlanders at the cost of racism. But this did help it win the Civil War. <clears throat> the trouble with this thing is if you cough, you, everyone hears, you can't turn away. Still, so apologies. This is section three of four, so don't panic, not too long to go. <laughs> British and Americans now know that global New Zealand history is coming for them. The ancient Greeks should also be warned. Classical Athens was once thought to have declined rapidly and permanently after its defeat in the Peloponnesian War, ending in 404 BC. It now seems that it recovered its wealth and population, though not its relative power, until about 320 BC. The key to this was its development of, a virtual, of distant virtual hinterlands. Athens' natural, natural hinterland of Attica had not been able to feed its population since the late 6th century BC. In the 5th century, it, Athens drew on its Aegean possessions. It lost these by about 14, 413 and turned increasingly to the Crimea in particular. There were other examples. 2,500 2, kilometres away by sea. It cultivated cultural as well as economic links with the Greco Scythian policy, polity there, which is confusingly known as the Bosporan Kingdom, meaning the Crimean Bosphorus or Strait, not the Dardanelles Bosphorus. This kingdom had a largely non-Athenian Greek settler elite, plus a mixed local component. Recent archaeology shows a big increase in Bosporan settlement sites and farm fields from the 390s BC. It indicates, I quote, increased agricultural production and increased investment in agricultural territory and rural hinterlands. The investment came from Athens. 
One farm had a grain storage cellar with a capacity of 400 tonnes. One farm. The Bosporan Kingdom sent at least 15,000 tonnes of grain a year to Athens and about 200 Athenian merchant ships for most of the 4th century. It sometimes exported lesser quantities to other states, but, I quote, when there, were, when there was not enough grain available for everyone, the dynasts of the Bosporan Kingdom forced buyers from cities other than Athens to leave empty-handed. The Athenians were privileged trading partners, always and always had the right to buy supplies. Unquote. At least four of these dynasts were made honorary citizens of Athens and given tax exemptions. Prominent Athenians in the Crimea received reciprocal treatment. The Bosporan kings called themselves King Archons, Athens be, uh, Archon being a peculiarly Athenian term for chief magistrate. Large-scale grain production in and around Crimea required farms and villages too extensive to fortify. This left them vulnerable to the horse nomads of the Pontic steppes, formidable warriors and slave raiders, generically known as Scythians. To farm effectively, the Crimea had to closely ally with a group of inner Scythians who would protect them from outer Scythians. So this recolonial system in involved three parties, the Athenians, the Crimean Kingdom, and the inner Scythians. There may be a takeaway for Maori history here. Inner Scythian and outer Scythian, engages and disengages, resistors and cooperators, protest and politics, are not necessarily pairings of opposites. Each needs the other to be effective. The problem in each case was that non-Greeks and non-whites functioned as defining others, lessons in what not to be. For ancient Greeks and modern Maori Europeans, modern Europeans alike. Maori and inner Scythians therefore needed to be somehow unothered or whitened. Edward Tregear's Aryan Maori thesis that Maori were of Caucasian blood, did the job in New Zealand. Its common usage variant was the notion that Māori were unusually good blacks, so good, in fact, that they were almost white, even if not genetically. And there's a number of cases of white New Zealanders telling off white South Africans and white Americans about saying, oh, you know, why are you cheering for these guys at rugby games? They're not white. And comparing them to their own non-whites. So it was, it was kind of, although people didn't use the label the Aryan Māori, there was a notion that Māori were better than other natives. And it was quite widespread, not universal. Some Māori leaders, such as Tarangi Hiroa and Apirana Nata, engaged with this myth-making. They did so to help Māori survive as a people during the dire century between the end of the New Zealand Wars and the beginnings of the Māori Renaissance in the 1970s. The chief proponent of the useful idea of imagined community, which basically is the idea that you feel as though you know, a community in which you feel as though you know people, if, even if they're strangers. In his context, he associated with the rise of modern nationalism. You feel a solidarity with people, even though you don't know them from a bar of soap because they're fellow New Zealanders, or Britons, or Athenians. He believed that imagined community brought nationalism into, bre into being, and that it required a print culture. Skipping back to ancient Athens, we find no such thing. There was no printing technology. But the Athenians did have image makers, singers, dramatists, preachers, and teachers. Among the goods flowing back to the Crimea with the returning wheat chips were elegantly painted vases. Their precisely delineated imagery illustrated Athenian versions, sorry, Athenian versions of Greek history, folklore, culture, and religion. They were Athens' main manufactured export, and though not especially valuable at home, they, I quote, bore, bore images of particular significance to their buyers. <clears throat> 
In the Crimea, buyers esteem these products enough to have themselves buried with them, along with jewels, weapons, and other valuable objects. The capital of the Bosporan Kingdom was present-day Kerch, which has become the generic name of the finest red figure Athenian vases. I quote, Attic, Attic ceramic production of the 4th century BC is called Kerch vases, as it is best represented from finds in the area, just as one might find, unquote, just as one might find the best preserved 1940s British cars in 1960s New Zealand. In the 5th century BC, Scythians had featured on Attic vases and in other art as barbaric and Asiatic in appearance. In plays, they appeared as comic figures, mocked for their rustic ways and harsh accents. In the 4th century, their ren rendering in Athenian art became, I quote an expert, broadly Caucasoid, quote unquote. Athenian Greeks and uh, Athenians and Crimean Greeks also produced gold plaques with a similar message used as decorations. Found exclusively, I quote again, in elite burials in the steppe region, just outside the territories of the Bosporan cities. In fact, these gold plaques were made in pieces equivalent to the mo most valuable Bos Bosporan Crimean kingdom coin gold coins, so they could be taken apart and used as currency, or at least indicated that currency. Athens had another problem in presenting itself as Scythian friendly. It was notoriously sexist, whereas the Scythians were not. Up to a quarter of their elite tombs contained women, often with military accoutrements. Here is the kernel of truth in Greek Amazon legends. Such tombs are especially common in the lands of Greek Crimea's inner Scythians, which, whom the Greeks associated and the Greeks associated that region with Amazons, that very region. The decoration of many tombs shows also, show, also show, this is the interior of the tombs, uh, quote, woman in banquet scenes, often in positions of seniority, unquote. One expert thinks that Crimean, Crimean Greeks and inner Scythian elites partied together in honour of the dead and intermarried as well. So Athens needed to somehow twist its sexist face into the most feminist version possible. A common motif of Kirch vases was scenes evoking particular Athenian dramas. Not with a single image, I think this is interesting, but with a series of them, rather like a cartoon strip. Drama in classical Athens was functionally akin to television and public education today. The big three, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, wrote 300 plays between them, and there were many lesser lights whose works have not survived except for fragments. In Attica, citizens were actually paid to attend the theatre, a practice unlikely to find much support from Mayor Brown. <laughs> the favourite drama on Kirch vases was Euripides' Iphigenia in Taurus, Taurus being the Greek name for the Crimea. Set at the time of the Trojan War, it is the woman Iphigenia who has agency in this play. She is, in the words of another expert, I quote, the nearest thing the ancient Greeks had to a quest heroine, unquote. Iphigenia was also connected to the goddesses Artemis and Athena, whose worship, according to an, a third expert, was prominent in both Athens and the Crimea. The grain ships underwrote transfers of people and letters as well as images. The Edward Tregear of fourth century Athens was the philosopher Isocrates, who had many correspondents in the Crimean kingdom and educated some of its elite in his school in Athens. Around 380 BC, he wrote, by so much as our city exceeded all man mankind in manners of thought and speech, that her students have become teachers of others. She has caused the name of the Greeks to be understood, not in terms of kinship anymore, but as a way of thinking. The result is that the name of the Greeks no longer seems to indicate an ethnic affiliation, but a disposition. Indeed, those who are called Greeks 
are those who share our culture rather than a common biological inheritance. Hello, Scythians, we love you, is the message there. Section four, final section. <clears throat> Could something as ineffable and respected, even sacred, as, a, as culture, collective identity, imagined community, or nationalism, really be transformed in a few decades by something as mundane as a cargo of imports? I think so. Before broadcasting emerged in the 20th century, culture had to have feet. It was transferable only through human traffic. Culture low as well as high was the chief export of hub cities like London, New York, and Athens. We know that specialized institutions from the Yanisaris to the Jesuits could re-socialize someone in five to 10 years from a potential enemy into a loyal servant. servant. Give me the boy and I will give you the man. I'm not suggesting conspiracy here, but something more organic and contingent, with various interests in both hub and hinterland thinking towards each other. As I said before, before opinion polls, the inside of the heads of silent majorities is a mystery to us. We have no choice but to judge by people's actions, such as mass volunteering for a dangerous war. Something must have caused shifts in attitudes. If not return, car if not return cargo culture, then what? <clears throat> Is recolonization quite the right word? Respected friends and colleagues ranging from JGA Pock Pocock to Jim McAloon dislike the term because they feel it implies a Pakia subservience to Britain, perhaps as late as the 1870s, even in 1982 when uh, Robert Muldoon uh, signed us up for the Falklands War. I still doubt this, although I take their criticism very seriously. Pakia considered themselves to be better Britons as proven on the battlefield and the rugby field, less plagued by class and industrialization. The white standard of living in the dominions was usually higher than in Britain itself. But it remains true that the term recolonization needs redefining and supplementing by a sister term. It is more regional, uh, more reciprocal than I originally assumed. These bloody glasses aren't working at short range. Uh, it was more reciprocal than I originally assumed. Things, thoughts, and people ricocheted back from New Zealand and the other dominions to Britain and influenced its history in ways I can specify if you wish. Pākehā identity, even nationalism, was perhaps stronger than I once thought, while a pan-tribal Māori identity, even nationalism, uh, arguably was stronger than some iwi historians might think. What we are looking, looking at is less a merger or expansion of single collective identities, as I originally assumed, than the development of compatibilities between small groups of them, an imagined community of imagined communities, each with a set of coupling mechanisms, like those between rail carriages, which allowed them to clip onto each other. Britain itself was such a concept not a nationalism, but a pan-nationalism. English, Scots, and Welsh. In the lead up to World War I, Antipodeans were particularly interested in adding the Irish to the Troika. One poem in the New Zealand School Journal in 1908 read, we're fighting for the shamrock, the thistle and the rose. Another by a Welshman in Ballarat in 1886 ran, the English, Irish, Welsh, and Scotch combined make up the Britain, monarch of mankind. Banjo Patterson ditched the, Wel ditched, ditched the, Welsh, in, the Welsh in the interests of rhyme in 1915. Our old world differences are dead like weeds beneath the plough. For English, Scotch, and Irish bread, they're all Australians now. Antipodean Irish boys too imbibed Greater Brit Britainism with their schooling in the more palatable form of white Australianness and white New Zealandness. Many went to state schools, 
In any case, Catholic schools had a sim similar secular curriculum and used the same texts and journals. Wider culture and peer pressures were also at play. New Zealand children in 1909 played toy soldiers with due respect for imperial military icon Lord Roberts, who was the British commander in the Boer War. I quote, the rule was that Bob's, Lord Roberts, on a white horse was never allowed to be knocked down by shells of an by the shells of an enemy, and whichever side drew him had to be victorious. A sense of guilt accompanied any accidental knocking of him over, end quote. The toy soldier likely came from London. To conclude, some cases I have spared you in this lecture suggest that recolonization was only a variant, though an important one, of something wider, which I've come to call urban colonization. Early modern Amsterdam, for example, colonised its own neighbours, and you could use recolonisation for that, but it also colonised distant European regions, such as southern Norway and the Vistula Basin of Poland, which it had not previously colonised. It was from these that the sailors, grain and timber on which the Dutch Empire outside Europe was built. Amsterdam and Friends was the term used at the time. And it was winning sea battles in the Baltic as early as the 1440s, 150 years before the emergence of the Dutch state it foreshadowed. It was not even a city-state at the time. It had no formal existence at all. It's missing from the history books, except possibly Dutch ones which I can't read. Urban Dutch language ones. I've read a lot of Dutch historians. Urban colonial systems could emerge without states, between states, or within states. Without, or within an empire, without incorporating the whole of it, so Greater Britain nestles within the British Empire. Uh, Greater Amsterdam doesn't even have anything to do with the Dutch Empire, which is outside Europe, except for supplying its foundation. White citizens in the British dominions considered themselves co-owners of the British Empire, not subjects of it like non-whites, and so were complicit in British imperialism, abroad as well as at home. Early modern Istanbul, another case I, I'm researching but haven't talked about in this paper, grew even faster than London in the two centuries after 1453. It developed a set of virtual hinterlands around the Black Sea and the Mediterranean to supply the hub city. It nestled within the Ottoman Empire, but did not include the whole of it, as with Greater Britain. As with ancient Athens, the Crimea was particularly important, and here too, a separate but compatible identity emerged, that of the Crimean Tartars. Such systems, I'm toying with calling them invisible semi-states, defied geography and could make a big, interest in, a big difference in world history, yet they remained camouflaged by their informality it takes New Zealand global history to uncover them. Thank you very much.